All right. So, um, yeah, so we're going to be talking about some CFD work we've been doing with Panzer, um, working with Roger. So, Brian first is just going to talk at a very um, high level about the type of equations we're solving. We're interested in here in this case in doing uh, compressible gas dynamics. I'm going to talk a bit about just uh, a deep dive into one element of code that we've done for uh, things like sensitivity calculations. And then Steve is going to talk a lot about linear solvers and preconditioning and um, our experience using GPUs for these types of problems um, and hopefully provide some good feedback. And then also, um, you know, see if there's anybody sitting in the Trilinos team that may have some interest in participating and kind of looking at some of the um, solver things that we have going on right now. So uh, next is Ryan. All right, so uh, hi everyone, uh, Ryan Glassby here. Um, relatively new to DOE space, uh, worked at a university and done uh, DOD problems for the majority of my career. Uh, back in those days, we, we, we learned along with our NASA colleagues, uh, the benefits of the continuous galeric and discretization schemes. And, you know, there are some drawbacks, obviously, um, but in that time frame, we kind of cut our teeth and along the way, watch, watch Roger make a lot of progress inside of Trillinos, and we're always excited to learn from Trillinos and to use Trillinos, uh, especially with respect to its linear solver stack, its, its fine element library, its, its Cocos enable, and, and kind of to push forward into you know, modern computing. Um, so just from kind of a generic sense, the PD is Navier Stokes, com compressible Navier Stokes, Euler, uh, but we like the aspect of Panzer that it's really open-ended. Uh, we could we could couple PDEs both monolithically or or loosely, um, bring in turbulence modeling, et cetera. If you if you're familiar with you know aerospace type problems, um, that flexibility is is quite useful. Uh, we you know we view the PDE written in weak conservative form, evaluated at quadrature points. Uh, the PDE in this sense is a time derivative convective operator, viscous operator, source terms. Of course, um, with the continuous scheme or any scheme, uh, artificial diffusion for the convective operators is a very important piece, as are the boundary flux. Um, so in this in this scenario, you know, we, we evaluate the convective, we take kind of our boundary state uh, and evaluate the convective flux and, and we apply it. Uh, dot it with the normal, and then we, we handle the viscous terms or any kind of gradient based terms with a penalty term. Uh, we like symmetric material penalty. We've also looked at bossy rebate, bossy rebate two, et cetera. Um, you know, they all have their pros and cons, um, but uh, so far so good uh, in that in that front. And then of course, you know, Deerslay Neumann. Uh, so here we have Kind of my past life with Streamline Upland Petrov Galerkin versus uh, the flexibility of Panzer allows us to look at other discretizations quite quickly. Uh, this is the entry viscosity method brought forth by Jean Luc Germont and uh, the company at Texas A&M. Uh, this is the Invis at uh, Woodward Koala, you know, Mach 3 step. Um, you see where SUPG does kind of emphasize some of the instabilities in the stagnation region, uh, understatement of the year. Um, you know, there there are questions about how to bring in boundary flexes and other things. So we're we're still kind of working this, but we're very encouraged by, um, you know, the clean nature of the the entry of viscosity method for this case. Um, and then another great piece about Trilinos, um, I had a JCP article with it with a grad student a couple of years back where we really dove into the esteric methods, and picking up Trilinos, they're just there. Um, we, we really like the Esther 2245. We also like 33 to put that plug in there. <laughs> that doesn't exist in Trillinos right now. Um, but we like we like their no dispersion methods, uh, low dissipation methods. We think it's really the, the right balance um, for for error uh, in a time sense. And so you can see here where our kappa operator is kind of our you know our diffusion flux uh, parameter. Uh, and so you can see here where, where the BDF, or I'm sorry, the Esther 45 really captures that Kelvin, Kelvin Helmholtz. And in this case, you know, 
I like to see where where errors are. We talk about spatial errors a lot, and that's very important. But I also think time errors um, deserve as much attention. Hey, Brian, are you using uh, Ridmos or are you using Tempest for this? Tempest, Tempest, Tempest yeah. yeah. So what's nice is with with Panzer, right? We just get a model evaluator out, and we're doing this fully implicitly. So all equations are done in time, uh, solved simultaneously every time step. We just have something that basically on the fly, we set a CFL and that thing will calculate a time step and we can feed that through a Tempest observer. And then that, that's what lets us kind of, in an input file essentially, right? We just have an XML file that we parse with Tepos and we can, we all these parameters, same input file, we just change that, that one Tempest setting and that one um, stabilization parameter setting. No, it sounds great. Yeah, I'd like to hear more about uh, the specific uh, time integrator you'd like to have because it should be easy enough to add. Oh, it's just SDIRK 3.3. Um, but yeah, I can I can certainly give you the Bisher Tableau for that and everything. Uh, but our 2.2 two and 4.5 are great as well. 2.2 um, two is kind of the workhorse just for, you know, two stages. But I would say the other thing with this, we've done a lot of time studies and a part of my JCP article was, you know, you can, you can 10 to 20 X the time step with four or five. And so it, I know there's five stages, but there's a lot of games to be played inside of those stages. There's, you know, you can freeze the left-hand side. Um, so it's not exactly five times more expensive. And then if you take a 10 X time step, then you're back in, into its you know usefulness um plus there's just things with four or five uh you know this this kh uh instability is just you're just going to get it you know whereas two two and certainly any bdf scheme you're you're kind of not really sure what what your error levels are and i would say that's the positive side of four or five you know the negative side is that uh it's an amplifier of your code. And so if you have any bugs in your code, they're going to be amplified very quickly. <laughs> so uh, we also have a lot of rules of how far to converge the linear system, uh, you know, per Newton problem, per stage. Uh, so I definitely would love to interact more with Trillinos um, with these time operators. It's, it's one of my, I guess, scientific passions. Kurt, are you the Tempest lead? I am. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh let's set up a call after uh kind of offline, and we'd love to talk to you more about this. Sounds great. Cool. All right. And then yeah, here's another case: the Napo cylinder. So this this is the Mach 17 uh, Rantry circle. Um, we we added the wake here to kind of show off uh, again the beauty of the higher order time schemes and what what's possible. Um, so there's that. Um, what else? All right, let's do it. Yeah. Um, all right. So what I'm going to talk about here, just briefly, is just go overview first all the packages we use. So you can imagine, you know, I'm I'm one of those people. I I started working with Trillinos a long time time ago, like I mentioned with Roger, um, heavily through the Castle program, and I'm a big fan of using things that have already been built up that are high quality like this and so i think you know we've written not a whole lot of code on top of uh i think if you went through and did a line count on all these you'd be well over one or two million lines of code at least that we're probably linking to um so you know we're thinking about a mesos and direct solvers uh in particular you know the the implicit solutions that you just saw we find that um that doing an overlapping scheme with something like if pack or if pack two, like an additive Schwartz method with a bit of overlap in direct solvers in the subdomains helps a lot. Um, we've been thinking about multi grid. Steve may talk a little bit about that. Um, he'll mention it. Um, we've had kind of mixed success with these class of equations with multi grid. Um, Bellos is our Creela solver workhorse for the, um, the solution inside of the Newton solve that we're doing for every time step. We're using ePetra in some cases, and that's really getting handled through Stratomikos, obviously, because 
Um, we've been linking into some external preconditioners that are EPESRA supported. Steve will talk about that as well. Um, Exodus and Stick right now are our main mesh infrastructure we're, we're building up through Panzer. Um, obviously, Cocos everywhere. So Steve and I have also been working on the Exascale competing project for the last six plus years. Um, on my end, I've been a, a pretty major user and proponent of Cocos and what we do. A lot of the um, Cocos team at Oak Ridge actually sits in my group building up capability to support the frontier backends. And now I think some of the um, stuff for Aurora. Obviously, we're using docs everywhere. And, you know, Roger is a major component of uh, helping out with that aspect of what's going on there, too. Phalanx is sitting under the hood. Um, Scada is really important for what we do, not only because as part of Panzer, we get the ability to build Jacobians um, to the accuracy of the discretization, but we also can then pass those into the algebraic preconditioners we've been using. And then we also have an interest in sensitivity calculation, which I'll talk about next. Some things that we did to extend Panzer to kind of make some nice sensitivity capability from the input file. Um, we already talked about Tempest. I think Theora is really important for what we're doing because it gives me this abstract numerical algorithm layer where once we write our code down, I essentially have a nonlinear interface that I can drive any sort of computation through, be it you know, solving the transient problem, solving a steady problem, asking for adjoints or sensitivities. That's something we really care about. And then right now we're using Zoltan. I'm not sure it may be calling Zoltan too. I'd have to look at the source code, but we're doing things like RCB partitioning. We're also calling the Parmetus interface under the hood to partition our grids. Um, so by my count, this is about 40% of Trilino's packages uh, that we're using here. All right, this is our phalanx execution graph. So if you're familiar with phalanx, it just builds a directed acyclic graph. The point of this is for not for you to read it. The point of this is just to show it's actually not that complicated and we're gonna make it less complicated. There's a lot of kernel fusion here, um, but it's sort of your typical gathers and scatters. The real big boxes that are in there are things like uh, equation of state evaluations, um, our stabilization scheme, and then some of the convective terms. Uh, and so we have some ideas on how to kind of improve performance. And we've been working with Roger a lot to talk about um, where are the right places to do kernel fusion for, for GPU performance, et cetera. Okay, next I'm gonna get into just something that we did a little code deep dive on um, ways we use the Tefos parameter list in XML infrastructure to kind of um, automate setting up parameters for theory interfaces and uh, in Panzer. So the big thing is we wanna allow developers in the input file to declare scalars uh, such that any object in our code, be it a Panzer evaluator or some other auxiliary data structure that maybe has um, Cocos functions, you know, a data structure that can be easily moved to device that does calculations, something that we want to parameterize so that we can get a sensitivity relative to that. Um, and so this allows in the input file to say, okay, I have a group of these scalar parameters and then I can sort of under the hood in the input file say, okay, instead of a double for this parameter, for example, I actually want this thing to, to be a uh, scalar parameter for sensitivity. The key here is, you know, once you start executing the code, let's say you're going to Thera and say, I have a response function and I have a sensitivity of that I want to calculate relative to a parameter. You've got to orchestrate basically getting the data out of Thera, which means getting the data out of the Panzer global data and propagating that to your objects at the appropriate moment. So that graph I just showed you, um, all this stuff has to occur before that graph evaluation occurs. So some examples, right? You may want to change a scalar value in a material property or a boundary condition or an initial condition to get some sort of, uh, let's say design optimization or something. So what does this mean from a user input point of view? So first of all, we could have something in our input file. Let's say you can imagine this coming from that forward facing step that Ryan showed you or that NAFO cylinder he showed you. Let's say maybe I wanna vary the thermal conductivity or the inflow velocity from the battery condition. And you know we just set these up here and then we set up something that's a nominal value. So if the user doesn't actually provide a different value through the theory interface when they're, let's say doing sensitivity evaluation, these are the values that get used in place. So I think the key is just pay attention on the next slide to some of these parameter names here because you're going to see them pop up. 
So this is what uh, our input would look like, let's say for setting up um, one of the battery conditions. So here would be a far field condition. So that's the type of battery condition we have on the outside of that cylinder case. You can just imagine it's sort of approximating flow into infinity. And I've highlighted um, the X velocity or velocity zero here in terms of the data input block. And you can see that we've replaced double with scalar parameter. So we wrote a lot of the, uh, we wrote some of those TEFOS XML overloads for a data type. And basically what that allows us to do is to point back anywhere in the code in our input file into the uh, original set of scalar parameters. And so what's really nice here is you could use that scalar parameter all over the place. You could turn it off if you don't want to parameterize the code relative to this, such that your theorem model evaluator would know nothing about the fact that this parameter exists. So that might be useful um, if you don't want to parameterize everything all at once. And uh, yeah, let's go on to the next one. So some things we considered when designing this, again, I talked about before I evaluate, when I evaluate a model through Thera, I get the values of the parameters that I want to evaluate this model at. And I have to basically inject that everywhere in the code, be it a Panzer evaluator or some auxiliary object before the graph gets executed to ensure that both the parameter values are in place as well as the, um, the derivatives uh, data structures from Staccato have been set up ahead of time. So we did this with an observer pattern. So essentially now all of our evaluators inherit from a new object, which says, I'm something that can be parameterized and therefore I need to go and extract parameter data before I evaluate the graph. Um, and then we have a brand new evaluator that's specifically for updating parameters under the hood. And we just use, a, if you're familiar with Panzer, we use a dummy tag to essentially say, everything depends on this one particular field, which is the parameter update. And so that gets pushed to the bottom of the graph and we ensure that uh, we get all of our parameters updated under the hood. And what's really nice about this is we can actually still use this, for example, uh, when we do our exodus output, that's still triggering a graph evaluation in Panzer inside of a, um, I think there's an observer that we wrote that does the exodus output. And so that makes a graph and this still allows the parameters to get triggered so you can get all of the field data, the solution data, and the auxiliary fields you might wanna calculate is a function of that solution data uh, with the correct parameter values. So what does this look like? Just kind of give you an idea, right? We have this new evaluator here, the scalar parameter evaluator. And you can see what I'm talking about. If you look at the constructor, um, I've got this dummy tag that sits under the hood that ensures everything gets evaluated. And then inside of pre-evaluate, um, you have something that just trickles down through all of the observers, the global data from Panzer, which contains all the information that it got from Thera. Um, then you can see here, this is just uh, from something that looks like a unit test. So we have an evaluator that might be parameterized. You can see two things. One that it inherits from our new base class evaluator, which overrides some of the um, fundamental Panzer evaluator capability, allows us to decorate that capability with other function calls if we want, as well as the scalar parameter observer. Uh, and if you look at the constructor in the left column there, the key is there's just this extra call called register parameter. And so that's how a user basically goes, says, goes in and says, here's an object that's going to be parameterized um, through, through uh, Thera. Okay, so that was kind of a nice way for us to, on the fly in an input, allow users to change how they parameterize the code, even in ways we may not have considered. Um, some things that will help us, we're largely thinking about sensitivity analysis and high order stuff here. So in the short term, we're going to be working with Roger on high order element topology support, so quadratic and cubic meshes. So this means loading those up in Exodus and then being able to do Panzer assembly on top of those. So that we think about in terms of, uh, you know, mesh functions that are order two, order three, independent of the basis functions we use to discretize equations. Um, and then Steve's going to talk about a lot of the general Panzer Cholino support we've been doing for CUDA. Um, longer term, tangent support in T-Petra, um, Hessian support in general in Panzer, and then we talked some about delayed Jacobian evaluation. I think that was, was that for performance reasons? Yeah, I, we talked about that in the Esther schemes. Yeah, okay. So next I want to move on um, to Steve talking about solvers and preconditioning. Yep, so I'm, I'm Stephen Hamilton. Uh, 
so some of the, the general solver considerations uh, that we've had in our code. So most of the machines that we're running on are still CPU based machines, but we're starting to have more and more GPU based platforms. Uh, so long term support for both NVIDIA and AMD GPUs is going to be important for us. Uh, we're at Oak Ridge. We've got Frontier here. So a AMD in particular is something uh, that, that's going to be a major concern for us. Uh, through the, the Panzer interface with Knox for the nonlinear solvers, we're running um, Newton solves. Uh, with Staccato, we have AD generated Jacobian matrices, and that's what we're using for our preconditioning. Um, to date, we've mostly focused on matrix based preconditioning. We might be exploring more physics based preconditioning in the future. Uh, GM Res out of Belos has been our workhorse. I think that's what almost all of our analysis work uses. One thing we found is that um, uh, the systems are really challenging, and so we we have to avoid restarting if at all possible. So as soon as the GM res restarts, um, things tend to stagnate, stagnate, and uh, everything kind of uh, falls apart. The the primary preconditioning approaches we're using are overlapping additive Schwartz through IFPAC or IFPAC two. Um, using either incomplete factorizations or preferably sparse direct solvers for the local domains. Um, the overlap has been pretty important to uh, robustness and strong scaling by um, getting a little bit of off domain information into the local preconditioners. We've tried algebraic multigrid, uh, but in this domain space, it just has not worked out well for us so far. And it, it doesn't seem to be particular to one implementation. We've looked at ML, MULU, and, and even the Boomer AMG out of Hyper, and we kind of get the similar performance. Uh, one of our team members is actually a former intern of both Jonathan Hugh and Ray Tuminaro. Um, so he's got a little more AMG experience and is going to be uh, pushing on this a little bit more for us. So we're, we're still hoping that we can salvage something out of algebraic multigrid long term. In, in terms of the Trilinos packages that we use, um, our solvers are built uh, through Panzer using Stratomikos. Um, so we have the parameter list based selection of solvers, which is really fantastic. It gives us access to uh, a ton of different packages, ton of different solver and preconditioning options. So we're using all of the Belos, IFPAC, Mesos, and al algebraic multigrid, at least in theory. Uh, we can use either ePetra or tPetra stacks. Um, uh, that's, uh, again, just through Panzer. Um, we've had some issues with some of the, the tPetra stacks, um, like the IFPAC2 additive Schwartz doesn't always work quite right. It seems to miss some user parameters, which has led us to using ePetra implementations for some of our production work. Also, we've seen some odd behavior with the uh, tPetra, the Amesos2 Pardiso MKL. Um, again, that's led us to using ePetra sometimes for, for more robustness. Um, on the GPU side, uh, because we because algebraic multigrid isn't converging when we're looking at the, the additive Schwartz type preconditioners, um, there's not a lot of GPU enabled sparse direct solvers out there. We've looked at SuperLU, um, which works okay. The performance hasn't been great. And then what has been our preferred uh, vehicle for NVIDIA GPUs is something out of the NVIDIA QSolver library. There's a, a GLU uh, solver which performs a one-time factorization on the host, and then it provides a device side refactor option. Um, and so what we do is on the very first time step, we do that host side factorization. And then for every nonlinear iteration and every subsequent time step, we're able to reuse that host factorization. So it really is a one time for an entire simulation. Uh, and this is, is something that we put in. Um, it's not in the public KuSolver documentation, so it gets a, a little bit wacky. It's something that uh, we discovered through interaction with some uh, ECP applications projects that they, they had been informed about. 
so this slide here is just um, some of the characteristics of different local domain solvers with a additive Schwartz type preconditioner. Uh, the figure on the left is, is iteration count. So this is essentially showing why we really like the sparse direct solvers. Uh, so the Pardiso and KLU, both being sparse direct solvers, have the same, those curves are on top of each other. Um, and you, you basically get lower iteration count out to larger processor count. So better strong scaling behavior in terms of iterative performance, whereas your incomplete type factorizations break down much, much sooner. Um, over on the right, it is showing the factorization time for the, the preconditioner setup. Uh, one of the interesting things here is that the Pardiso MKL sparse direct solver, the setup time is lower than even the incomplete factorizations in, inside of Trilinos. Um, so we've uh, had a lot of success with that Pardiso MKL solver. Uh, at high processor count, the behavior of KLU and Pardiso is, uh, becomes uh, not very large. But if you have, have a lot of work per processor, we see much better performance out of Pardiso. Um, and then here, these are some, some really preliminary results from our, uh, our CUDA solver. Um, so this is all of our infrastructure is built on Cocos. Um, and so if we build with CUDA, then we have a, a GPU enabled solver. Uh, this is using at least the, the far right column is using this uh, CUDA solver GLU as, as a local domain solver. Um, where we're at right now is that the preconditioner setup, even with the GLU is, is a little bit slow compared to CPU based solvers relative to where we would ideally like it to be at. Um, but the, the the solve time is, is generally pretty good. Um, and the GPU, um, so the, the nodes that we're running on have two GPUs per node. Uh, the amount of work that we need to saturate the GPU keeps our domains pretty large. So we get good iterative behavior. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's all there. Um, we were talking with Roger Pulowski last week. Uh, he was on site at Oak Ridge, um, and we'd mentioned some of the things we were doing to be able to uh, create this CUSOLVER GLU uh, instance. Um, and he thought that it would be a really good thing to, to briefly touch on in this uh, presentation. Um, what are we on time? Got maybe just a, a couple of minutes. I'll try to move through this quickly. Um, so we, we've relied on Stratamicos for building our, our linear solvers, which is really great because it's all um, you know, XML driven um, the using the Tefos parameter list. Um, and so we've got lots of flexibility in what we can build using Stratamicos. Uh, but when we went to trying to inject our own local domain solver into Stratamicos, uh, things got a little bit more complicated. Um, and one of the reasons was that the Stratamicos factory is an instance-based method, and that instance in our use case is inside of Panzer. So there was no way for us to get that instance and register our own solver with that Stratamicos instance. So we, we essentially here had to reproduce, uh, replicate behavior that's inside of Panzer uh, to be able to use our own native factory. And so here um, you can see over on the left, uh, we're registering several different factories with Stratamicos, um, one of which is something that we have implemented then over on the right, what that factory is really doing is it's building an IFPAC2 additive Schwartz object, and it's setting the inner, inner preconditioner to a local GLU solver, which is just some wrapper that, that we have created. Um, and then here's, here's the implementation of that. Uh, so the local GLU solver implements in the IFPAC2 preconditioner interface. Um, and then internally, it's gonna take the T-Petra matrix and it's going to extract the data out of it. It's going to hand it off to CUSolver, and then it's going to use the CUSolver functionality to actually do that apply. Um, so th this process has worked for us, but there was a lot of code that was necessary to actually implement this. So lots of interaction with Thera, 
um, unwrapping and wrapping uh, the hierarchy of Thera objects. So, so it actually took a, a fair amount of code just for what was kind of a, a simple idea of being able to replace the local domain solver um, inside of the additive Schwartz. Um, so to, to wrap up uh, a couple of wish list type items from the linear solver side uh, would be to have more of the, the preconditioners um, automatically supported by Stratomicos. And what I mean by this is not having to register the factories explicitly with the Stratomicos default linear solver builder. So it, it seems like the ePetra based solvers get registered, but everything that comes through on the tPetra side, you kind of have to manually register with the Stratomico solver. Um, also the like the online documentation with Stratomicos it is amazing for the ePetra stack. It, it has this nice, you can click through and say, well, if I've selected this solver, here's all of the list, all of the valid parameters that are available. And that doesn't seem to be available with the tPetra type stack. Um, again, being able to, to more easily register a user implemented preconditioner within the Stratomicos hierarchy would be great. Um, this is also going to be relevant if we go down the path of physics based preconditioning. Um, we're going to have solvers that we are writing that we want to still use uh, the rest of the linear solver hierarchy. Um, and then the, the availability of GPU enabled preconditioners um, is something that we, we would love to see more activity in this area and we would, or we would love to hear about activity that is is already going on that maybe we're, we're not familiar with um, because it seems like if if algebraic multigrid doesn't work for your problem you just don't have many options so we have this ku solver path for nvidia but for amd gpus we actually don't have a, a clear-cut path forward right now we're we're evaluating super lu but um, we just don't know what that's going to look like. Um, so something like the KU solver GLU refactor based sparse direct solver, but sitting natively in, inside of Trilinos or something like that would be amazing. So we took all our time, Kurt. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, no, this is good. Uh, we have a, a little bit of time for questions. Jonathan, I noticed you had a little comment in the chat. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that. Uh, just mentioned that there was, uh, uh, there's been some improvements in the IFPAC2. Not sure if that actually helps or not, but you might want to check it out. That was essentially Jonathan's uh, comment oh, there. Good. Okay, okay. Is, that in, is that sitting in master or is that in 13.4? I actually think this might be some of the stuff that Max has been talking with Ray Tuminaro about. So we've been trying to get updated to uh, the developed version of Trilinos. We're on 13.2 uh, right now. Um, so I think this will be able to evaluate uh, some of this, hopefully in the very near future. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you can hear Jonathan, but uh, uh, he said he was aware of some of those conversations. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, Max Lupo Pacini has been, I know, has been interacting with Ray Tuminaro on on this topic. Okay, okay great. And, and quickly, Ross. Hi, this is Ross. Um, so is your custom uh, preconditioner, is it just inheriting from the, um, the basic theory interfaces and is it accepting a linear operator as your source and you're just producing your preconditioner out of that? Um, so we, so our preconditioner implements, so we don't implement it at the Thera level. We imp implement the tPetra ifpac2 interface. So it's an ifpac2 preconditioner. And then we take that and we wrap it into a, the appropriate Thera linear op with solve or, or whatever. I, I forget the exact class. Like preconditioner base. Yeah, we, we, we wrap it into something to then um, hand to the Thera factory. Does that make sense? I just wanted to register those things. Not to go through the object stack to do it, but I think that's relatively easy probably. Just with static functions and so forth. Yeah. Well, you should uh, contact me offline and let me know exactly what you're trying to do. 
Okay. Yeah, I think that's a good idea because we're going to be doing a lot of that type of stuff in the future, I think. So hey, if we can streamline our process better, that would be great.